In the name of the triune Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and Mother of us all. Amen. Today begins the second week of Advent, so we are just three weeks away from the birth of Jesus, which means Mary is about 38 weeks pregnant. Her breasts are leaking colostrum, her cervix is dilating, and in utero, Jesus is about the size of a leek. At 38 weeks, Jesus is practicing grasping, grasping his own umbilical cord, grasping his own hand. Also, he'll be able to grasp Mary's finger when she taps his palm on Christmas morning. The in utero Jesus has just shed all the downy, furry hair that has kept him warm these last few months. In fact, he's broken that downy fur down and digested it, and it's now building up in his intestines as meconium, which is the fancy word doctors give to the tar-like olive black substance that is a newborn's first excrement. In other words, right about now, in utero Jesus, is gearing up to defecate. So here's an Advent discipline. In addition to lighting your Advent wreath and opening the windows each day on your Advent calendar, you can download onto your phone a day-by-day -day pregnancy tracker and follow Jesus and Mary's last prenatal weeks. Most of these pregnancy trackers compare the growth of the baby to various fruits and vegetables, but at least one pregnancy app has a Parisian bakery setting, which would allow you, should you some year wish to chart the entirety of Mary's pregnancy, to follow Jesus as he grows from the size of a profiterole at 11 weeks to a croissant at 18 weeks to finally hear at 38 weeks a dacquoise which I had to look up. I've never heard of a dacquoise. It turns out that it's a cake that layers hazelnut meringue and whipped cream with sponge cake. The Baked Good Pregnancy app might be a bit over the top, but I have actually done this pregnancy tracking thing during Advent. It was suggested to me by a friend who is a Baptist pastor and a doula. And I find that it is actually a helpful and theologically right-headed Advent practice, at least as germane to Advent as lighting a wreath of candles. Because of course, what we're waiting for during Advent is not just more light in the winter darkness. We're waiting for the birth of the Lord's flesh into the world. And to expectantly contemplate that exactly is to contemplate dilating cervixes, and in utero babies eating their own fur. So we are waiting for Jesus to be born, and Jesus is waiting to be born. But of course, Advent is weirdly about a dual kind of waiting. Advent is about both awaiting the birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago, and Advent is about waiting on Jesus to return. Our prayers and our song We'll focus our attention today and in the coming weeks often on that second kind of waiting. Give us grace, we pray in the second Sunday of Advent's Collect. Give us grace that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Stay awake, be ready. You do not know the hour when the Lord is coming. We will sing in a few minutes. Now, let me pause to note that I realize that here in the Episcopal Church, the idea of Jesus's second coming, the whole idea of Jesus actually coming back through the clouds to walk the earth again and to consummate God's program, I realize this is one of those bits of doctrine that Episcopalians aren't always sure we believe, or we're not sure what we believe about it. We're pretty sure we don't believe in crazy scary rapture scenes, like in the Left Behind novels that were so popular a decade or two ago. But we aren't sure exactly what we do believe about the actual second coming of Jesus. So then during Advent, it's much easier to focus on preparing for Christmas than it is to prepare for that return of Christ. But I want you to try something. For the rest of today, 
and even for the whole of the next week and maybe for the whole rest of Advent, I want you to pretend that you believe that Jesus could return tomorrow or next week. If you aren't sure you believe it, just pretend and see how it feels. Jesus is waiting to be born and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father waiting to return. And we are waiting for Jesus to come again into our lives. There are, of course, many different kinds of waiting. There's the annoyed waiting when you're in line at the DMV. There's the slightly strange, slightly buzzy waiting that occurs when you know you're waiting, but you aren't sure what you're waiting for. Waiting stretches time. It thick and thins time all at once. To the Lord, says our epistle reading this morning, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like one day. Well, that may be how it is to the Lord, but I'm sure I'm not the only person who read that epistle passage and thought, well, that's also how things are in pandemic time. Time has gone wobbly one day like an eon, and an eon like a flash. Have you noticed that when you're waiting for something, your whole life gets shaped around the waiting? When I think back to high school, basically all I remember is waiting to go to college. In college, I did a lot of waiting for my boyfriend to propose, which thankfully he never did. Then there was the season of waiting for my mother to die. That waiting shaped everything for about a year and a half. This is true, I think, on a smaller scale as well. If you're waiting for a guest to show up for dinner, remember back when we had guests over for dinner, if you're waiting for a guest to show up for dinner, that waiting flavors everything. If you're waiting for the dough to rise, that waiting flavors your whole afternoon. For my part, these days, I am mostly waiting for all the distractions to cease, for my inner flywheel to stop whirling about like it's trying to win some award at a spin class. I fear I'll be waiting for a long time. And what are you awaiting? I suppose we're all waiting for the pandemic to subside, but that waiting, I suspect, is layered atop other waitings. Maybe you're waiting for some season when people will stop making demands on you, a season in which you'll have time and space to think. Or maybe you're waiting for your kid to finally appreciate you or for your kid to get well. Or maybe you're awaiting the day when you can turn on the radio and not hear about an 18-year-old girl shot in the face in her car in Akron. That happened just this past week. Or a 12-year-old girl shot fatally and by accident by her neighbor, as happened also this last week in Columbus. Maybe you're waiting for the day to come when we can look at the newspaper without reading about another wave of fentanyl deaths or another spike in child poverty. I think at bottom, most of our waiting is simply the hope that we and our neighbors and indeed the whole world will one day be more the way God means for us to be. This is just another way of saying that we are waiting for Jesus to come back and make us whole. In accordance with his promise, this morning's epistle says, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. And this is why the season of Advent bids both our joy and our lament, why we light one rosy pink candle and three solemn blue candles. Because to wait is to recognize that something is not yet as it should be. I wonder what it is like for Jesus to wait to return. Maybe it's like the Olympic swimmer waiting for the 100 meter freestyle, the event that will be the culmination, the event that you've been training for all these years. Or maybe Jesus experiences 
in this period before his return, maybe he experiences a kind of intimacy, as when your wife has been out of town on some week-long business trip, and she'll be home tonight, and you devote the entire afternoon to making a special dinner for her. There's the marketing and the setting the table just so, and the chopping of the vegetables and the stirring of the roux, and that waiting is wholly unlike the waiting in line to get your driver's license renewed. That waiting for your wife to come home from her trip has a rich intimacy to it. You aren't yet reunited, but all that preparation and all that daydreaming about her return, all of that is in its way enjoyable. And in its way, it actually produces a kind of intimacy even before she returns. Perhaps Jesus awaits his return on clouds of glory like that, awaiting or ribboned by intimacy. And all our Advent practices, the candles, the Advent calendars, the pregnancy app, they are but so many dinner preparations. They layer our waiting with intimacy. They already draw us toward the one for whom we wait. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Isn't that a strange and perfectly wonderful thing for our epistle to enjoin, that we are to find our salvation. We are to find our being made whole exactly in the Lord's capacity to wait. Have you ever noticed that if you look really closely at something for a long time, you become like the thing you're looking at, you become like the object of your gaze? Or have you ever noticed that if you listen deeply to a piece of music, if you listen to a piece of music deeply and attentively for a long time, you become shaped to it? You've been listening deeply to a sonata or you've been listening deeply to a Christmas madrigal. And so you know how it goes. You know its melodies and harmonies. And then you're around in the world and you hear just two notes that belong to your piece of music. And you are in a different situation than someone who has not been listening. You have been conformed to the melody. So you sort of quiver when you hear those two notes. Sometimes you can't even consciously say, oh, those were two notes of Beethoven's fifth. You just know you know them and that you're quivering to hear the whole thing. And you feel sort of weird and incomplete if you only hear those two notes and are left waiting for their conclusion. That is the tenor of our waiting and also of the waiting of Jesus. Intimate, like the spouse preparing the dinner for her beloved's return. Intimate and active, like the mother readying herself for the baby, but also a little tense, a little uncomfortable. The sense of incompleteness until the waiting, like a melody, resolves. Amen.